Hi, everyone. Um, we have a delay, so it will uh, slide into the coffee break. I know coffee is important. I will try to be concise. Um, for the last uh, two days, you uh, learned a lot about libraries and uh, build tools. And now I would like to tell you something about how to code something interesting without any of it. Um, my name is Maciej. I work at Wire in Berlin, and I will be talking about cellular automata, which is a model of computation and some kind of a mathematical theory. And it can be used to, well, have to create some interesting uh, pictures as well. Uh, so we will be talking a bit about what are cellular automata, and um, also uh, how to like um, what can, how can they be used in real-world situations? And because uh, no talk about solar automata can go without mentioning Game of Life, so there will be Game of Life and also Langton Sand, another popular implementation of solar automata um, with a quirk. And uh, then at the end, I would like to tell you something about how cellular automata relate to artificial intelligence in general. So, um, what are they? Um, in short, uh, cellular automata is a way to model complex processes by breaking them um, into a set of rules applied again and again over time on data spread, spread on a discrete lattice of, la of cells. We need just a few things for that. First of all, we need a cell. It's a data structure, and in Scala, it's, it will be just a case class with some fields. Um, then we need a board of those cells. This board is both a collection of all the cells, but it also tells us something about uh, the uh, rela relations between cells in space. It can be two-dimensional or three-dimensional, and in Scala it will be implemented as a map of positions to the cells themselves. Um, yep. So uh, then we need a concept of neighborhood. Every cell computes its own ver new version uh, by using its own data and the data of the cells around it. So it's always local. It never tries to uh, access everything in the world. There are two ways to um, two most popular um, neighborhoods that are von Neumann, which is just cells up, down, left, and right of the cell which we are talking about. And there's more, which is like all cells around the one. And we are talking here, because it's a short presentation, we are talking here only about two-dimensional cells with uh, only like square, who, are, who can be um, shown up on the screen as squares, so they have only four uh, directions. And that neighborhood in Scala, in this way, it will be a function from the cell, or most likely its position uh, in the on the board to a map of positions to all the cells in the neighborhood. Then uh, we have rules, because of course the cell is um, tries to compute its new state using some functions. So in Scala, that will be a function from the cell to a new cell uh, using the neighborhood as a way to get data. And then we need a loop. A loop takes the board, computes all new states of all cells, and then it recreates that. So it's basically an iterator in Scala. And what are they for? Probably you use it even today although uh, you might not know it, uh, the most popular way uh, to use uh, cellular automata is to model water. So every time you check water, somewhere there in the model of the uh, data station that t tries to tell you if tomorrow will be raining, somewhere there, there is something similar, at, at least at some level, using cellular automata. So uh, imagine our planet, and you can see that um, we can divide our planet into, into cells, into squares on the surface. And in every, every in such cell, we have some data. We have uh, latitude, we have the um, air pressure, we have temperature, of course, we have humidity, and so on. And water is not magic, it's just a way to the physical, physical laws uh, ap applied to, the, to all those data are updating the data itself. And for every cell, we only need the information about the data inside the cell, and 
of the files around it. And, well, this way, when we compute the whole board, uh, the whole planet, and then again the whole planet, we can, after some time, say, okay, this is how the weather will look next day or next week. There are also uh, implementations of cellular automata used for modeling physical laws, especially gases and fluid dynamics, which are strangely complicated when you think about it, and uh, other simulations. And generally, uh, cellular automata are um, mostly used for things that are f look a bit like our real world. So we can have a, an ecosystem where we have a cell which is a part of a big jungle or, a, or desert, and this way um, they interact with, it, with each other. We can have a traffic in the city, or we can have an, an economy of a country, and that also we can split up into cells and compute them uh, separately and locally. Uh, it also works for microbiomes, and in fact, microbiomes was an um, inspiration mm, to develop this model, is how uh, microbes are fighting for resources and multiply. And also, uh, automata can be used for low-level artificial intelligence, which I will talk in a few minutes for a moment, and for procedural data generation, which is something like creating pictures out of nothing. And Game of Life, of course. Uh, the most popular cellular automaton out there uh, was developed as some sort of a theory uh, by John Conway, who is a professor at Stanford, I believe. And um, in the 70s, it's a very simple thing. First uh, game of life was played on a board of checkers and not on a computer. Uh, so we have a cell that can only have, that have only one field and this is uh, the state if the cell is alive, is alive, so it's black if it's alive, or it's white if it's dead. The board is two-dimensional, and the neighborhood is more, so that means that all eight cells around it are the neighborhood, and the rules are like that. If the cell is dead, and the neighborhood cells are uh, in the neighborhood, there are three cells that are alive, then the new version of that cell will be alive. If the cell is alive, and in the neighborhood we have two or three cells that are alive, the cell will still stay alive in the next iteration. Otherwise, if there are like not enough live living cells in the neighborhood, or if there are too many living cells in the neighborhood, then the next iteration of our cell will be dead because of l loneliness or too much crowd. Okay, now that's we can show how it works in practice. So for a board which is mostly white, we can put some shape on it, whatever, and bam. So you can see that this is the board updating itself time after time. We can see that there is some chaos in it, and there are some more patterns that are more uh, um, regular, periodic, but they also work only for a moment, and then uh, they become chaotic again, and then they become stable like this. Yep. Uh, let's go back here. So, how to implement it? Um, in Scala, we can create a small case class. Let's call it Game of Life, and we can create a board, create a board for that, that case class. There will be just one field, Life, and the board will have a method for finding cells in the neighborhood. Um, there's a problem, though, uh, at the beginning. If we create a board, and that board is used to populate the, need to populate the cells, then, again, when we have a cell which tries to find a, uh, its neighborhood that needs that board, so that's like a chicken and egg problem. So that can be easily changed. We can have a game of life class, the cell class that has a position and has a method from the position to the other cell of game of life. So this way we can be lazy, we can uh, find other cells in the neighborhood only when they are needed and not at the moment, so we don't need the board at the moment of uh, creating the cell itself. And then we need a method called update that will create our new, uh, new version of the cell. This will uh, return here only a 
option of game of life because if we don't change anything, then we can never use our existence. So we don't have to create the same, the copy without any changes. Um, and then on the board, we have a method next that creates a new version of the board by updating every cell of the board. Uh, there's a, sorry, um, one change here. We have the map on the board is not really a map of positions to, to the cells, it's a map of some kind of identifiers to the cells. That's because uh, the positions are not always one-to-one. -one. Um, let's take a look at this board here. We have, uh, for every cell in the middle, we have eight neighbors, but if we talk about edges and corners, there are literally corner cases. If we are in the corner, we have only three neighbors. If we are on the edge, we have five neighbors. And that would mean that we need either to have some special rules or change the map, the board, a bit. And we can do it. Like, you can remember from the planet, we can wrap the board around, and that's why we have now, when we go here, when we are here and we try to, uh, on the edge, and try to get a neighbor which is even more to the left than we are on the edge to the left, then we go around and we get the cell which is the most to the right, and vice versa. Well, that's still a problem here on the poles, so we can do it again, we can wrap it the whole the whole board can wrap be wrapped inside out, and this creates like something like a donut here, which is which can be done, which can be traversed around from left to right and right to left, but also it can be traversed from north to south or up to down and down to down up. This way, we don't have any edges anymore or any corners. Every cell has eight neighbors, and we can just live with it. Um, as you can see, every time we update the whole board, we create the exact copy of that board with some state changed. So that's actually an iterator. In Scala, we can simply extend an iterator of the board, and call it automaton, that's our uh, cellular automaton. And the automaton will have some dimension, which is the side of the board, and it needs some methods. For um, first, we need a method that will uh, create a cell, we give this method a position and a function that will find the cell, so that's the one that will find the cell in the neighborhood of the cell we are creating. And also, for the automaton, we need a method that will create the board itself. So um, that board, that apply board method takes the, uh, the size of the board and a method to create a cell. So that leads us to probably the most magical line in the whole project, which is this, that we have a board in the uh, iterator, which creates a board, taking the, mm, the size of the board, and taking a function, which will create a cell, and that function that will create a cell takes the position on the board and takes a function that will find a cell in the vicinity of, the board, uh, of that cell, and there. We have something like reaching into the future. We have this, this board here it does not exist yet. It will be created only after the whole apply board method. But that's it. The next method is fairly trivial. And now our iterator is always, has always the next uh, version. It's the half next is always true. And now we can, in Scala, use this automaton as uh, every other iterator we can flat map it, we can use it in for each and so on. Okay, so another example that I would like to use also to, to show you how much of the code is the same, no matter how, what cellular automaton we try to create. This is Langton Sand, um, created by Christopher Langton in 86. Um, it's a bit more complicated, it has, the cell has two, um, uh, two fields, the color, black or white, and the direction of the ant. So we can say that on the board we have an ant which can go up, right, down, or left, or the cell can be without, uh, without an ant. The board is again two-dimensional, and uh, this time the neighborhood is von Neumann, so it's only up, down, left, right. So yeah, we have only two, uh, two fields in our case class. Uh, the cell of plankton sand, and for rules, rules are also a bit more complicated. If there is a um, 
for every cell, we check if there is an ant in the neighborhood. If there is an ant in the neighborhood, then we check its direction. If the direction says that the ant will come to us in, the ne in this uh, turn, in this iteration, then uh, we, up we change the, uh, our um, direction to like having the ant, but the ant will change the uh, change its direction for example if uh, if the color of the cell is uh, black then the uh, then the ant will be turned 90, 90, mm, di uh, 90 degrees right if the color of the cell is white then the uh, the ant will be turned 90 degrees left otherwise if there is no ant in the in the neighborhood then the direction will not change it will be still none um, for color, it's simply that if the ant is going to the cell, the color is flipped, otherwise it stays the same. So we can create the case class, Langton's ant. It will have the color, the direction, the position, the uh, function to find cell in the neighborhood, and the update method. So you can see that a lot of it is exactly the same. We can create a trait for automaton cell that will have the things that are set the same in Langton Sand as they are in Game of Life. So that's the position, the method to find cells, and the update method. And we can also rewrite the board. And we can also rewrite the automaton itself. And one, maybe one curious thing is that we have uh, this trait has a lower bound here, which says that because if we want to find a cell of at the given position, then we want the cell itself. We don't want just the trait. We need to access those data, which is uh, only in the case class Langton Sand. And one more thing, because this is the first time in my whole career as a Scala developer that the power map uh, immutable parallel map uh, turned out to be a huge boost to, to the uh, to the speed of the whole project because uh, cells are local and they can be easily distributed. So uh, using power map instead of map gave me like 30% faster uh, execution. Um, all right. Yeah. So we have only this to implement. Like every time uh, we create a new automaton then we need to only implement the, uh, the data and the update method. And let's make it a bit more complicated. Let's say we can have uh, ants that are not only black, but they can ha have different colors. We can have a yellow ant, a magenta ant, a cyan ant. They don't interact with, with each other, but when they go to fields, they go to cells, they change the color of those cells, and the colors can mix. So we can have uh, a more interesting, colorful pattern on the screen. Yeah, exactly. Mm. Okay, so these are four ants working on the same board. We can add some more to show how they not interact, in fact. Um, and a bit more. Yep, so the in the places they go to the same field, you can see that we change this color from cyan and magenta giving us blue, and cyan and yellow giving us red. And just as in Game of Life, and just as, as in every cellular automaton, we have one, um, we have this uh, chaotic phase coming up from very simple uh, rules, very simple a few lines of code. And, um, but they, at that some point, they will change into, they will start create something more reasonable, something more mm, periodic. So you can see that at some point, no matter how complicated is this whole pattern, uh, one of the ants will create this kind of a highway going around. It will just move like this to up to the moment when it'll, it will hit the, its own old path, with at which point it will start to go to the chaotic phase again, and at some point, like another minute or two, it will uh, create another highway. Okay. 
Um, and that leads us to how cellular automata corresponds to artificial intelligence. So, because we can use those chaotic phases and periodic phases to actually uh, get some uh, interesting uh, results. In, in normal way of using artificial intelligence, we have, if we want to um, have some prediction, we usually ha have like uh, try to train our artificial intelligence using some real data. For example, let's imagine we have this huge data set that tells us that there was something in the past, then there is something in the present or like recent past, and we can feed that information to our artificial intelligence, to the neural network, for example, and then we can um, try to use that, uh, the, uh, that teaching method to say, okay, now please simulate what will happen from the past to that present moment, and then we can compare what the artificial intelligence predicted and what we have already, what we know. And from that, if we, we will be able to teach the, uh, the artificial intelligence by feedback methods um, how, uh, how to predict something based on those data, we can get uh, better predictions and then we can say that, okay, so our present uh, is now your input data and please uh, tell us something about the future, so predict, predict something in the real future. Um, so how do we teach it? If we use artificial neural networks, then it will be probably some pr back propagation methods. If the artificial intelligence are uh, cellular automata, then we can probably, we can't use back propagation, we can use well, if the cellular automaton is big enough, then we probably have some coefficients that we can tweak a bit. So we can use genetic algorithms for it and Monte Carlo methods. But anyway, uh, it's usually important to actually invent better models and we need actual humans to sit down and rethink the models for that. Um, there are some advantages though. Um, we have a better under understanding of the underlying processes because cellular automata work in a way that are more easily easy to grasp by human beings. It works locally and on some, ki some kind of 2D or 3D boards, which is like the, the way we live and the way we, live, we think about the world. The mathematics is simpler because we try to split complex equations into, into simple maths and our communications uh, is also easier because we use our simple words and intuitions. Um, one thing I want also to tell you about is that we can use the same approach for low-level AI, for example, in computer games. Let's imagine a hero coming into uh, some kind of an area where we have some NPCs, the non-player characters, trying to kill the hero. And usually, uh, in a classic approach, it would mean that every of these characters are, uh, has an AI connected to it, like some kind of a brain, and they think for themselves and try to kill the, the hero by itself. But we can also think of the whole area as one big cellular automaton. Instead of every, every NPC trying to fight for themselves, you can think that the whole uh, the whole area is first in some kind of a stable state. So, for example, there is no hero, so we just see NPCs going around or just staying in one place. Then the hero comes in, and that means additional input of data, so which mm, moves the whole area in some kind of a chaotic phase where the rules of the cellular automaton are such that uh, the characters try to kill the hero and become the, and get into the stable state again. So this also solves us the problem of teamwork. Usually we just, uh, th this is the most difficult part and uh, the one that is in computer games are usually a bit unreliable. We, mm, we can see that NPCs are just stupid and are mm, just not working together, while in the case of cellular automaton, this is like something that we get for free. Um, you can see the examples and the code and the documentation on GitHub in CA, um, GitHub com, making the matrix CA art repository. And I'm working on rewriting this code in Rust and moving it a bit into that low level AI territory with this. And um, I used uh, 
usually um, most of the uh, things I told you I got from the book Fluor Automata at Difficult Universe by Andrew Ulachinski. You can find me on Twitter, on Wire, and you can talk to me right now. Thank you. Uh, questions? No? Okay, thank you again. Yes? When you model the Earth for weather, would you make, like, uh, in the um, latitude and longitude, uh, make a kind of um, trapezoids or would you try to make uh, areas that have equal uh, area and so they will have um, well not work like a chessboard it depends on uh, it depends on the ex on the model used by the company with David and I suspect that this is the main problem with uh, p mm, forecasting the weather more in the future because every time in, no matter if we use squares and uh, then we have uh, the good idea about the space but we have but we don't uh, get it good when it goes to the more to the north and south or we can try to get it trapezoid, but they, it's also not perfect. Um, then uh, when we try to uh, create new iterations for, for more, more future times, then it gets m less and less exact. Uh, in fact, it's not only our purpose. You can see here that we also try to uh, get some, some cells that are in the, in the air, like um, more to the uh, like one kilometer or two kilometer high, but these are, this information is not that important. Usually, w this can be also uh, simplified. For example, this is only our air with some temperature and humidity, while the cells at the surface are more complex. They have more data. Anything more? Okay, then. Thank you.